All right, tough topics. If you um, have not been with us, uh, if you're just kind of visiting, um, we have been going through a series called Tough Topics, and we are basically taking some of the most difficult things to uh, talk about, to preach about, to speak about, and we're putting them all into a series. Now, awesome for me, right, that I get to do that, that I get to like take the most difficult things and over several weeks try to break them down. So uh, last week we started kind of a, a two-week uh, mini-series. I tried to combine it all into last week and it just wasn't happening, but uh, last week and this week we are talking about sexuality and gender. So this is Tough Topics, Sexuality and Gender, Part 2. Um, and please understand... I know that this could be a very, very sensitive subject and is a very sensitive subject for some people. I've had people come and share things with me already in this series, and please understand, I want to do this with the most amount of love and compassion and grace and mercy and non-judgment and, at all. And, and in fact, my message last week and this week is really more for the church, Okay, it's really more for Christians and how we need to act and how we need to talk to people and how we need to deal with and understand some of these tough topics, especially uh, of sexuality and gender. Now, um, I said it last week, I don't have any jokes. I still don't have any jokes this week because this isn't really a topic that you can joke about, but after last week, and this isn't going to make sense if you weren't here last week, after last week, my wife wanted me to tell you that she does cook and she does clean, <laughs> and that she doesn't just sit around the house and eat bonbons all day. Okay, she said, please, would you say that? Just wanted to throw that out there. No, I, I love her. She's actually working back in, in kids' ministry today, so, um, but we can, we, can, we can laugh a little bit, but understand again, and I, I'm going to keep drilling this down. I'm going to keep saying this over and over and over because this is so important. All the while, while we are talking about these tough topics, all the while, while we are probably going to be pressing some nerves and maybe, you know, I, 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 I joked about it a few weeks ago, I am an equal opportunity offender. If I don't offend you this week, I'm probably offended you last week, or I may offend you next week. Okay, but, but we're trying to do this as sensitively as possible, but we have to keep two things at the forefront, and that's unconditional love and uncompromising truth. Unconditional love and uncompromising truth is the heart that we have to have as we are thinking about this, as we are talking to people about this, as we are dealing with this, as we are navigating through society nowadays, unconditional love, but uncompromising truth. And we've got to have a comprehensive understanding about what God's word teaches about this, not what society is trying to tell us, but what God's word says about these things. So, in order to cover this subject, um, I came up with four truths about sexuality and gender, and I know a lot of you were, were gone last week. Uh, so I wanted to do a quick recap, and especially if you're kind of visiting, I, the, the, the last week's message was really the crux of what we really need to understand in this. So four truths about sexuality and gender. Number one, the gift. The gift. Now, this is the most important of the four truths. It's the gift. And in his complete awesomeness, God gave us the wonderful gift of sex and intimacy, and then he commanded it. Genesis 9, 7 says, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. So God actually commanded that, which is a wonderful thing that to know that this comes from God, but it's very clear in scripture that sexual intimacy is between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. No other time. Scripture is extremely clear. Genesis 2.24 says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And this shows us that a, a sexual union physically, emotionally, and spiritually, or in God's eyes, unites 
a man and a woman. Notice that verse doesn't say anything about a wedding. It's talking about a sexual union, and that's what unites a man and a woman. And since the beginning of time, again, I'm going to continue to say this, this is God's plan for a man and a woman to be united together in a marriage. And this is where society may say, man and a woman, that's, that's not tolerant, that's not accepting, that's not affirming, that's not loving. And we said that not loving someone is being too afraid to explain the truth of God's word and the benefit of God's plan. That's what not loving someone is, is being too much of a coward to say, I just got to let you know that God loves you. Okay, and God has this amazing plan and you're not living in it. And if you would just trust me to live in it. God has so much more for you. That's what we as followers of Jesus need to step up and be able to say. Unconditional love, uncompromising truth. So four truths about sexuality and gender. Number one, the gift. Number two, we said was the drift. The drift. And in this, we're talking about promiscuity. We're talking about a now what's called a hookup culture. And it's very, very prevalent in this world. And see, God has this perfect and wonderful plan, like we said, for sexual intimacy, but we often just kind of bypass God's plan and we settle for crumbs, right? You remember that last week, settling for crumbs or licking the plate with that illustration? How, how many of you left here so hungry last week after the, the whole, yeah, well, I made a huge hibachi dinner last night, so y'all can be hungry again, but don't settle for crumbs, don't settle for second best or third or fourth or just whatever. Don't settle. God's plan is so much more than anything you could ever imagine. First Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. And when we drift from God's plan, we're settling for crumbs, and we're not trusting that God has something so much better. And what did we say was the gateway activity for just, just all of this sexual sin? It's pornography. And it is a huge, huge problem in our world. We read so many statistics last week that are scary of how prevalent it is. I think it was 169 billion dollars made annually by the porn industry in the U.S. That's a problem, and it is tearing apart people's minds and our kids because it's so accessible. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So how do you break the addiction of, of porn? Well, we said two things. Number one, accountability. Get some people in your life that are going to hold you accountable. Now, number one, accountability, that's your responsibility and that's your choice. But number two, you need to renew your mind. You need to renew your mind and see that's something of God's authority and God's control and God's power. Do we have to pray, hey God, I want to be broken of this, whatever it is. God, I, I want you to help me break this habit, break this cycle. God, renew my mind, and he will do that. So four truths about sexuality and gender. Number one, the gift. Number two, the drift. And here we go. Number three, the twist. The twist. Now, here's where it might get a little bit dicey. Here's where we might split some hairs. But see, even worse than just drifting away from God's plan, it's become popular in our society and even rewarded or celebrated to twist God's plan into something that's just completely unnatural and unbiblical. But again, caution, church people, caution, unconditional love, uncompromising truth every single time. We don't judge we don't condemn, we don't shame. So the twist, what am I talking about? Well, we're talking about homosexuality 
when we're talking about transgenderism. It's two major things. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news or it's, it's just out there in our culture so much more than it, it has been in any of our lifetimes. And we as the church need to know how to deal with it, how to have these conversations. So homosexuality and transgenderism. Transgenderism, I, I do want to talk about a little bit for us to have a better understanding. So as I see it, maybe there's more, but I think that there are two main categories that transgenderism fits into. Number one, it's you're just choosing that lifestyle. Just whatever your circumstances that you grew up in, whatever, you're just choosing that lifestyle. But I want to focus a little bit more on the second reason is that a lot of people that are battling with this, that are facing this, and they will tell you it is a battle, um, have a mental condition called gender identity disorder that was formerly called, or it's now known as gender dysphoria. And this is a very real medical condition. Remember, we even mentioned it a couple weeks ago when we talked about mental health. And again, historically, the church has not always done a great job of addressing these issues. And oftentimes, we, we prioritize sexual sin, don't we? For some reason, and I, I, I don't understand why, and it's, it's wrong, but we, we seem to separate sexual sin over other sins. And, and, and you know this, we even have a phrase for it, we call it living in sin, right? We, we even use this phrase to describe sexual sin sometimes, and, and I don't know why that is. We, we don't have a phrase for a, a habitual liar, or we don't have a phrase for somebody who cheats on their taxes, or, but sexual sin, oftentimes the church and, and churchy church Christian people, if you know what I'm saying, I mean, just kind of go after this. So again, these messages aren't necessarily to speak to people who are dealing with this. It's really to speak to the church and how we need to deal with this. Because we've often judged, we've often condemned, and we've often shamed. And that's not the heart of Jesus. Jesus never dealt in guilt. He never dealt in shame. Ever. And if he didn't do it, guess what? We don't get to either. So that cannot be our attitude. So, but just to be clear, because, again, very prevalent in society, very prevalent in some churches, very prevalent with some Christians that you'll see on, on TV. I'm thinking in particular of an interview I saw with a, a Christian artist that Oh, well, homosexuality, uh, that's not really a sin, or that's Old Testament, that's not really new, that's the law, that's, and they try to work around it, you know, in the name of, of affirming people or loving people, they try to water down the fact that it's sin. It is sin. Just to be clear, Scripture is very, very clear that it's sin. Um, go ahead and put those verses up on the, the screen Here's six passages if you want to look at. We're not going to look at them now. We don't need to. Uh, you can just take a picture. You can look at them later. Six very, very clear passages that tell us that homosexuality is a sin. Again, we don't get to, to judge people. We don't get to condemn them. We don't get to treat them differently. But in case anybody ever says, well, that's not really in the Bible Here's six. And you say, oh, well, it's just an Old Testament. No, there's three passages Old Testament, three passages New Testament there. So, again, don't look at those now. Um, look at them later. But so, so that's clear. But how do we deal with someone or talk to someone or treat someone who's experiencing this gender dysphoria? How do we do that? That's, that's kind of... I mean, I never heard of that growing up, and, and it's really only in the last couple few years that this has, at least to me, I mean, I know it's around, but really it's become a thing. So what exactly is gender dysphoria? Well, it's the feeling of discomfort or distress that might occur in people 
whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth or sex-related physical characteristics. So if someone is born as a male, as they're growing up, as they're developing their thoughts, it could be early on in childhood, it could be later on in life, they say, you know what, I just don't feel like a male. I identify more as a female. And then they go through this lengthy, horrific process of transitioning. And people are, and it's vice versa, women to men, men to women, it, it's going both ways. So how do we as a church understand this better and learn how to deal with it and have these conversations better? Now, before I go on, I do want to say there are rare occasions where people are born with both male and female re reproductive parts, or they're born with an excessive amount of hormones in, on one or the other side. That's completely different. That's a separate category. Those have to be dealt with individually with their doctors and healthcare providers, and th that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about people who are, are choosing this lifestyle or who are battling with this mental thing that is going on. And it really is a, a diagnosable mental issue that they're having. Now, what's the solution? How do we deal with someone that's experiencing this, this mental issue? To get there, I want to give you an example of another mental health issue. Has anyone ever heard of I'm going to botch this. I've been practicing it for two weeks. A potemnophilia or xenomelia. Anybody ever heard of a potemnophilia or, or xenomelia? A potemnophilia or xenomelia? No? Okay. Here's the definition. They're, they're very, very similar. I don't know why. There's, there's two different things as I read through them. They seem like the same thing to me, but here's the definition. The syndrome of a potemnophilia Body integrity or amputee identity disorder is defined as the desire for amputation of a healthy limb and may be accompanied by behavior of pretending to be an amputee. Now this is a real mental health issue. That someone for some reason does not feel like, say an arm, does not feel like they should have that arm anymore. For some reason, they feel like their arm should be amputated. And sometimes it even expresses it, it like, like it will kind of, in their mind, psychosomatically go paralyzed and they can't use it. It's a real health condition. Now, let me ask you. If they go to their doctor, and this is a good doctor, okay? This is a good doctor that cares about the patient, and they say, doctor, I just don't feel like my arm should be there. It's, 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 it's wrong for it to be there. I, I, I want to get rid of it. Will you take it off? What should that doctor say if he's a good doctor? He should say no. He should also say, okay, you're, you are dealing with something different. You are dealing with something that is more in the realm of mental health. Let's put you with a counselor. Let's, let's deal with it that way. Your problem is not your arm. And very gently he would say, your problem isn't here. We have to deal with the root issue, not just do the thing that you want to do. Now, with that, I believe that is the very same way that we need to deal with gender dysphoria. We don't treat the problem, we don't, we don't just go in that direction. Any good doctor would tell him, no, we need to find out what's underlying. We need to find out what's going on. Culture says, your psychology or feelings are your sexual identity. Let your body be conformed to it. That's what culture says. Your feelings, your psychology, how you feel, how you identify, that's your sexual identity. Let your body change to match that. That's what culture says. But scripture, or God says, your body is your sexual identity. That's how I made you. That's how I created you. I created you perfectly. Flaws and all, that's how God created us. But your body is your sexual identity. Let your mind 
be conformed to it. You see the, the huge disconnect there? You see where our society and some doctors who, for whatever reason, are choosing to allow people to go down this path of transitioning, irreversible. But see, God says, no, 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 I have a better plan. That's how I created you. Yes, they're, they're, mentally you are struggling with something. And again, I already said it. They will tell you this is a struggle. That, 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 that they are in this battle in their mind that they just don't feel like themselves. But it needs to be dealt with in the right way, in the biblical way. And society of the world is pushing that sex and gender are two different things. Society is pushing that, that sex is what you were assigned at birth, and they're like afraid to even say that now. And gender is how you identify. That's what society is saying. But we, we can't choose to identify as something different than God made us. Because don't you see how the enemy's working? When the enemy can plant in our mind, you are something different than God made you. The enemy has won. And that's what is happening here. Sex and gender are the very same thing. But the whole time, unconditional love, uncompromising truth. Are these very, very difficult situations? Oh, yeah. Are they very challenging conversations? Yeah. Are you probably going to stumble and say the wrong thing? Probably. I would. But at the end of the day, we've got to keep coming in with God's love. God's love. This is what God says. This is God's plan for your life. And pray that they allow you to speak into their life. Unconditional love, uncompromising truth. So four truths about sexuality and gender. Number one, the gift. Number two, the drift. Number three, the twist. And number four, the fix. The fix. What do we need to do? At the risk of maybe coming off a little bit sharp, I'm going to say it anyway. There's two things that we need to do. The, the first is for those churchy Christians, right? The ones who are condemning. The ones who are judging. Okay? Which one time or another, all of us, whether it's a sexual related sin or not, one time or another... We all struggle with that and battle with that. So I say this as lovingly as possible. We need to do two things. Number one, we need to shut our mouths. Whoa. Yes. Because oftentimes, the first thing that come out of our mouth is judgment. So we've got to be very, very careful. So number one, shut our mouths. Number two, a little bit of a uh, contradiction here, open our mouths. Okay? But what do we need to do? What needs to come out of our mouths? Love, grace, mercy, and truth. We need to shut our mouths, and then we need to open our mouths. How, how, how does that verse go that I've heard be, before? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That's that thing. That's what we need to do. So the fix Two things, number one, shut our mouths, open our mouths, and number two, here's the fix. Know that God loves us and longs for healing and relationship no matter how much we have sinned. No matter how far down the rabbit trail you've gone. No matter how many bad choices you've made. No matter how strong that addiction is that you have, no matter what, know that God loves us. He longs for relationship. He longs for healing. He longs for us to cry out to him and say, God, I need you to rescue me. As Larry O'Neill would say it, that's what he cried out when he got his cancer diagnosis. 
God, rescue me. And God did. And that's exactly the role that God wants to play in our lives. He wants to be Savior. He wants to be rescuer. He wants to be comforter. No matter what, there is never, ever anyone that is too far gone. Nobody that's worthless. Nobody that can't come back from wherever they've been. So I've got an illustration. I didn't make this up because I'm not smart enough to do that. So they say plagiarism is the best form of a compliment. So here we go. This is you. This is us in our purity, maybe in our early life, in our teens. And oftentimes we decide way too early outside of God's plan to give ourselves away. And we start taking pieces off. And there was another time. There was another. And, and we figure, well, there's, I mean, I already started to give it away, so there's some more. And, and, and you're feeling less and less and less. Uh, until one day, that's pretty much it. And you give it all away. And that's what you're left with on your wedding day. That's it. Now that doesn't look very desirable. You would say, who would want that? Who, who, who wants that? Jesus wants that. That's exactly what Jesus wants. He wants you to come to him in your brokenness not fix everything up and come to him then. You know, God can't handle a little bit of mess, so you better get it cleaned up and then go to God because, man, he's never seen that stuff before. No, no. This is what he wants. And he takes us, and in our brokenness, he starts to put us back together. And he takes all of those petals, everything, and he kind of puts it back together and he takes broken pieces and he does something amazing. And when he's ready, he makes all things new. See, because that's what God does. He takes broken pieces and turns them into masterpieces. And whatever you give him, he will take it, no matter what. No one is too far gone. No one is outside of his grace. Everyone, everyone. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you want us. God, we make big mistakes in our lives, not just sexually, but big, big, big mistakes. And God, we make terrible choices that we never thought we would do. And one day we wake up and there's nothing left. There's no more petals left on our rose. And we realize Nobody's going to want that, except for you, Jesus. That's how you want us. You want us to come to you in our brokenness, in our hurt, in our pain, in our bad choices, in our sin. And you want to turn things around. God, I know there are people here this morning or attending online that all of us have made some pretty bad choices. 
And right now, maybe some are feeling broken, undesirable. God, would you step into their lives? God, right now in this moment, would they give that empty rose to you? Say, God, I need you. Rescue me. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. Today is the day. Today is the day that you find salvation. Would you in this moment just say, God, I need you. God, I trust that your son hung on the cross for my sin, making a way for me to spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out, but I just want to celebrate it and pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, I got that today for the first time. That today I made a decision for Christ. Again, maybe you're here this morning that you are one of those broken pieces. If today's the day that you're going to decide, hey God, would you just step in? Would you do something awesome in my life? Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up? Say, that's me. I need prayer. God, we come before you this morning for the lost, the broken, the hurting. God, would you do what only you can do? Step into people's lives. Make changes. God, I pray that we fully follow you, that you are the centerpiece, the cornerstone of our lives, God, and that we put nothing else before you. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, thank you for the generosity of this church, just the amazing things that we are able to do because people are generous, because you are generous with us. So bless this time of offering, God. Help us to be wise. We pray all of this in the awesome, powerful, and healing name of Jesus.